What's going on guys, my name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $600 and for that price you're getting a system that offers great performance, being able to play all of today's most popular games in 1080p with 60 plus FPS. This like many of my builds in the past is going to be a full PC build guide. This means I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and talking about why I picked them, but I'm also going to be showing you how to put this exact system together step by step, show you the software and drivers needed, and finally show you how the system performs in a number of different games. This is a very well rounded system and could even be used for stuff like streaming and entry level video editing. I made sure to pick reliable parts that should last for years to come and should allow for a smooth building experience. When I'm building PCs, I generally have earbuds in, and I'm usually listening to audiobooks from today's sponsor, Audible. Audible is by far the largest provider of audiobooks, and I've used them numerous times in the past. Whether it's cooking, driving, or even exercising, Audible allows you to take back that time by providing you with entertainment or even self-improvement. Right now, they're offering a pretty sweet deal, which is a free trial that provides 30 days of unlimited Audible originals and one free audiobook. And that audiobook is yours to keep even if you decide to cancel your membership later. Some of these audiobooks cost up to $50 a la carte and you can snag one for free by going to audible.com slash techbymat or by texting techbymat to 500, 500 My recommendation is for you to listen to Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. This story set in dystopia in 2045 follows protagonist Wade Watts on his search for an easter egg in a worldwide virtual reality game, the discovery of which could lead him to inherit the game creator's fortune. What's also awesome is Ready Player Two is set to be released this year, so after finishing Ready Player One, you'd be ready for the sequel. Again, to get a free audiobook and 30 days of unlimited Audible originals, visit audible.com slash techbymat or text techbymat to 500, 500 Thanks again to Audible for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. So getting back to the build, it's now time to show you each of the parts and talk about why I picked them. Let's start things off with the CPU. Believe it or not, this is actually an Intel based system, which in the current time is kind of rare compared to the much more popular AMD builds. What I went with is Intel's new Core i3-10100. This is a great entry-level CPU that provides good performance for the dollar. For the going rate of $125, you're getting a 4-core, 8-thread CPU with a base clock of 3.6GHz and the ability to turbo all the way up to 4.3GHz. This is on Intel's latest Comet Lake architecture, meaning IPC for this chip is pretty good. Now this is a lock CPU, meaning no overclocking, but stock performance seemed to work great in my experience. To cool the CPU, I'm using the stock Intel cooler. This comes free in the CPU box and does a decent job of keeping our CPU relatively cool and quiet. It definitely isn't as nice as the AMD stock coolers, but it gets the job done and is free which helps save money to be used in other areas in the build. Moving on to the motherboard, I went with what seems to be one of the better value for the money B460 boards on the market. This is the Gigabyte B460M DS3H. The M in the name signifies that it's a micro ATX board which is important because the case we'll be using. At around $80, the DS3H offers a number of great features like 4 DIMM slots, decent back panel I.O., and a good PCIe slot layout. This board has everything we need, and it doesn't hurt that it looks pretty nice in my opinion. Overall, for $80, this motherboard provides good price to performance, and I can highly recommend it. Moving on to the RAM, this is an area where we don't need anything fancy. The 10100 only supports up to 2666MHz RAM, so I knew that as long as I got a dual channel kit with speeds at or above 2666MHz, then I'd be good. What I went with is this 16GB kit of DDR4 RAM from the company Oloy. This RAM is rated to run at 3000MHz CL16, which is more than fast enough for our system. Also, because this is a 2-stick kit, it ensures our memory will be running in dual channel operation. 16 gigabytes is more than enough for modern gaming and should be enough to run some stuff in the background like Discord. At around $50, this is a really good value for the money and shows you how cheap RAM is getting. Now let's go ahead and talk about storage. For this build, just like many of my budget builds, I tried to get the largest SSD I could fit in the budget, leaving the option to upgrade in the future. What I went with is this 512 gigabyte SSD from Silicon Power. This is an NVMe SSD in the ultra compact M.2 
2 form factor. This is a PCIe Gen 3 4X drive which produces some pretty good performance. This is more of an entry level NVMe drive but it works amazingly in this system allowing for fast boot times, fast program loading times and just helps improve the overall snappiness of the system. 512 gigabytes is more than enough for your OS, applications and a number of your most played games. This should be enough to hold you off until you can upgrade in the form of another SSD or with a large mechanical drive like this 2TB Seagate drive for around $50. Moving on to the graphics card, I went with something that I haven't had the chance to use before this build, which is the AMD RX 5500 XT. This is a great 1080p video card being able to play any game you throw at it. This is the 4GB model which some may shy away from because 4GB won't be super future proof, but it should work fine for years to come in my opinion. Also, for around $30 more you can go for the 8GB version which I'll have both linked in the description below. This particular card is a Gigabyte OC model and it features a pretty nice dual fan design with a backplate. It has a pretty good sized aluminum fin array and multiple copper heat pipes allowing for pretty good cooling performance. All in all I'm very happy with how this card performs in gaming which you'll be able to see later during the benchmarks. For the power supply, I went with a 450 watt 80 plus bronze unit from EVGA. This was $55 when I picked it up, but I'll leave a few different power supply options below in case the price of this one has changed. 450 watts is more than enough for this system and the 80 plus bronze rating means it runs pretty efficiently. It is non-modular which isn't a big deal because you can hide the excess cables and a big positive is the fact it has all black sleeved cables. For $55 this is a good deal and I can highly recommend it. Finally, let's talk about the case. This is the Cooler Master MB311L which is one of the best budget PC cases I have ever built in. At 60 bucks, it is towards the upper limit of what I wanted to spend on a case for this build, but it was well worth it in my opinion. It has a full front mesh panel with two included ARGB fans that are both quiet and look awesome from the LEDs. Controlling the lighting is a little janky, which I'll explain later, but it does work fine. This case packs a lot of features even beyond the front mesh and fans like the power supply basement and big tempered glass side panel. All in all, this case looks good, performs well, and is a steal at the $60 price point. Overall, for $600, you're getting a set of reliable parts that should last you for years to come. I can't speak about the future, but in modern games right now, the system performs great at 1080p. But before I go over performance, I want to show you how to put this system together. This is going to be a step-by-step -step guide that you can follow along while you're building your PC. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I use this driver kit which I'll link below. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver, this will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next let's talk about static, I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. Start by getting out your motherboard box, open it up and grab out the board itself, the IO shield and the manual. Take the motherboard out of the bag and rest it on top of the box it came in. Grab the CPU clamshell and open it up so it's ready to go. Bringing your attention to the CPU socket on the motherboard, push down and out on the metal lever then lift it up to reveal the socket. Pick up your CPU handling it only by the edges and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard and lower it into place. You can also line up the notches in both the CPU and the socket. Once in, you can lower the socket back down and push the retention arm back down under the clip. Doing this will also make the socket cover pop off. Make sure to save this cover in case you need to RMA the motherboard or transport it without the CPU in the future. Now go ahead and grab the cooler that came in the CPU box. Flipping it upside down, you can see that it comes with thermal paste pre-applied so there's no reason to add our own. Lower it down with the Intel logo facing up and lining up the pegs on the cooler with the holes in the motherboard. Now press each of the pegs down until they snap into place. 
Now take the CPU fan cable and bring it to the CPU fan header. Line the notch in the connector with the notch in the header and plug it into place. Now it's time to install our RAM. Open up both tabs on slots 2 and 4 which are the gray ones. Now take your first stick of RAM and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once in, press down on each side until the two clips snap shut. Repeat the same process for the second stick of RAM. Next thing to do is install our SSD, bring your attention to the M.2 slot located below the CPU socket on the motherboard. Start by removing the small M.2 screw pre-installed in the motherboard. Get out your SSD and line the notch in the drive with the notch in the header. Insert it at an angle and hinge it down so the notch in the drive lines up with the M.2 peg and use the screw you removed earlier to secure it into place. Once this is done, you can set the motherboard to the side and get out your case box. When removing the case from its box, one tip is to lift the box away from the case instead of trying to lift the case out of the box. This makes things a little bit easier. Once your case is out of the box, start by unscrewing the bottom and top thumb screws on the back panel. Once this is done, pull back on the panel and lift it away. Next, grab out the accessories bag from the drive cage. This contains all the screws needed to assemble the system. Next, set the case on its side and unscrew the four thumb screws holding the glass side panel. Once this is done, lift the panel away. Grab the IO shield that was taken from the motherboard box earlier and with it oriented like this, lower it to the IO cutout and press each corner into place until it's secure. Now with that in, grab your motherboard handling it by the cooler and lower it into place lining up the IO with the IO shield and making sure you see the standoffs through the motherboard holes. Next, grab out six motherboard screws that look like this. Take these and install one in each of the motherboard holes that has a standoff beneath it. Now you can lift the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply. Now with the power supply fan facing down, insert the power supply like this and push it to the back of the case. Use the four screws that came with the PSU to secure it into place. With that done, we can now start to route cables. Start by taking the small front panel connectors that look like this and route them through this hole here. Next, take the HD audio cable and route it through this hole here. Now take the PCIe connector that looks like this and route it through the same hole as the front panel connectors. Now take the large 24 pin connector and route it through this hole here. Next, take the USB 3 cable and route it through the same hole as the 24 pin connector. Next, for this top right hole, insert the 8 pin CPU fan cable that looks like this and the end of the fan splitter that looks like this. Now you can set the case onto its side to begin plugging things in. Start at the top left of the case by grabbing the fan splitter end and plug it into the fan connector next to the 8-pin header. This plugs in the same way the CPU fan connector did. With that in, take the 8-pin CPU cable and line the notch in the header and the connector and press it into place until the clip latches over. Now moving on to the right side of the board, grab your 24-pin connector and just like the 8-pin, line the notch in the connector and the header and press it into place. Now below this is the USB 3 header, take the USB connector and line the notch on the connector with the cutout in the header and press it into place. Now we're going to plug the connectors at the bottom of the board starting from the bottom left. Start by locating the F audio header and insert the HD audio connector with the text facing down. Now at the bottom right of the board we're going to plug in all of those little front panel connectors. Start by taking the one that says power switch and plug it into these two pins here and orientation doesn't matter for this connector. Directly to the left of that, plug in the power LED connectors with the power plug to the left and the negative closest to the power switch. Now take the reset switch and plug it directly below the power switch. And finally, take the hard drive LED and plug it to the left of the reset switch with the plus facing to the left. Also, you may find plugging in the reset switch in the hard drive LEDs first is easier, so do whatever is easiest for you. With that done, bring your attention to the back PCIe covers. Take the top two covers and twist them back and forth until they snap off. This is also something you can do before inserting the motherboard, which may make it a little easier. You can now get out your GPU because it's time to install it. First, open up the PCIe lock like this. Now take your card lining up the notch in the connector with the notch in the slot. Lower it down and once you're sure it's lined up correctly, you can press it down until it secures into place and the PCIe lock snaps shut. Next, take one or two of the same screws used for the motherboard and screw these into the PCIe bracket to secure the card into place. Now take one of the 8-pin PCIe power connectors and line the notch in the connector with the notch in the graphics card and press it into place. With that done, put the case back onto its feet and bring your attention to the back. 
Because the motherboard we're using doesn't have a digital RGB header, it means we have to use the RGB controller included with the case. Take this and plug a SATA connector into the end like this. Now take the 3 pin RGB connector from the fans and plug it into the other end of the controller. This controller has a number of different modes, but because it is inside of the case, it means you have to remove the back panel to change the modes. For someone like me who just sets a profile and never touches it again, this works fine, but for some people this may be a deal breaker. With that done, you can now do a little cable management by pulling all of the excess cable length to the back of the case and making sure all the cables are flat. I would recommend now turning on the PC and looking through the lighting profiles to pick one that you like. Once done, power the system back down and reinstall both of the panels, but before screwing on the glass panel, make sure to do the always satisfying plastic peel. With that done, the system is built, but there are still a number of things that we need to get done before you start gaming. The first thing is you need to install Windows. I'm not going to go into how to do that in this video, but it's relatively simple and straightforward. I'll have a link to a video tutorial on how to do it in the description below. Next thing you need to do is with the system shut off, hit the power button, then immediately press the delete key repeatedly until you enter into the BIOS. Once in the BIOS, go ahead and enable the XMP profile for the RAM. Save changes and then exit. Once this is done, the last thing you need to do is install some drivers. You'll need to install motherboard drivers and GPU drivers. All you have to do is download these, extract them, and then install them. I'll have links to all the necessary drivers and instructions in the description, so make sure to look there. With this done, you're ready to start playing some games. Hopefully that guide was helpful to some of you who are wanting to build this system. It's now time to go over the gaming benchmarks. I tested 8 of today's most popular titles, but if there's one I didn't include and that you'd like to see in the future, let me know in the comment section below. Let's start things off with COD Warzone. This is a pretty demanding game, but at 1080p medium settings, the system pushes out an average in the mid 80s, which is pretty respectable and provided a very enjoyable experience. Next up is Fortnite, which I tested at 1080p pro settings. Doing this resulted in an average in the mid 100s with a fair bit of fluctuations. With all this being said, the system provided a more than adequate experience in this title. Next up is Rainbow Six, which I tested at 1080p high settings using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 235 FPS average, which shows you for a game like Rainbow Six, the system should work fine for even the most competitive players. Next game I tested was Apex Legends, which is still my favorite battle royale game of all time. At 1080p ultra settings, the system stayed right around 100 FPS, which was a really nice gaming experience, and I'm sure a 120 FPS average is possible with dropping a few settings. Now let's talk about Borderlands 3, which represents a hard to run AAA game. In this game at 1080p using the built in benchmark at medium settings, the system output an impressive 86 FPS average. Moving on to CSGO at low settings, the system put out an average around 300 FPS with some pretty substantial fluctuations. This all in all was a pretty good experience and just like Rainbow Six, this should be plenty of performance even for competitive players. In Rust, I test at 1080p with what I think is around medium settings and doing so resulted in an average around 105 FPS. Now this was just while running around, but I'm sure even during combat, the system shouldn't drop below 60 FPS. Finally in Fall Guys, at 1080p max settings, the system was able to stay at a lock 60 FPS the entire time, and as far as I know, there's no way to unlock the frame rate in this game. So as you can see, the system performs really well at 1080p. Again, if there are other games you want to see tested, let me know in the comments section below. Overall, for $600, you're getting a pretty powerful system that should last you for years to come. I hope this video was helpful or at least entertaining to some of you out there. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you guys keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. So yeah, guys, I think this wraps this video up. Thanks again to Audible for sponsoring this video. Remember to go to audible.com slash techbymat or text techbymat to 500, 500 to get 30 days of unlimited Audible originals and one free audiobook. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.